what I do want to do is to make sure that we give this time to the Lord. Father God, all that we have, we owe to you. The very breath we breathe, the heartbeat within, we got from you. And Lord, we want to make the most of what you've given to us. So I'm asking that you'll take this, your servant, in the next few moments. Allow your Holy Spirit to work in me and through me, that I might be a man of faith that Jerry talked about. I just want to be a suit of clothes in which you live today that would express all that you are through your word. I also ask, Father, that you give the listener ears to hear and a heart that's obedient to what we hear from your book. And we'll ask it in the name above every name, that matchless name, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Amen. Before I announce our topic and read any scripture for our message today, I want to try to get us all on the same page. And that's sometimes difficult to do. I know people come from different places, and I've, I've had several mothers over the years tell me, said, you know, Sunday morning is the worst time for worship. When I get five kids, by the time I get five kids dressed and, uh, and redressed and redressed and then come to church, well, I'm worn out, and uh, their thoughts are a million miles away. But I'd like to get us all on the same page, and if you would allow me to do that, I want to begin by telling you a story about a young man who, at about the age of 16 in high school, uh, he got interested in bodybuilding and weightlifting. And while he was a student in high school, he joined the wrestling club and was a great wrestler in high school. And in the state, he received great notoriety as a good wrestler. When he graduated from high school, he chose a college that had a good wrestling team. And this young man went to a college to receive a degree, but while he's there, he still wrestles and continues his bodybuilding. When he graduated from college, he, his degree was such that his employer said, you can name the hours in which you want to work. And he said, okay, I want to work Monday through Thursday. And they worked that out, and he said, I want to keep Friday and Saturday open so I can wrestle. And the man loved to wrestle. Six foot six, 230 pounds of solid muscle. And his job every weekend was to enter into a wrestling arena and would pick up another man and smash his body against the canvas. Sometimes he would throw his body against the ropes and smash his body against another to be able to pin him. This man loved wrestling. Six foot six, 230 pounds of solid muscle. But this morning, he's flat on his back on the living room floor, back on the floor, and he's crying out, somebody help me. Somebody help me. I can't get up. I can't get up. Somebody help me. And he keeps crying out, somebody help me. I can't get up. And every time he cries out, there's a little three-year-old boy that giggles. And one of his legs is on one side of his daddy's neck and the other on the other side, and he's seated on his daddy's chest. And his little hands, still so small and short, are buried in the palms of his daddy's hands. And his daddy is saying, somebody help me, I can't get up. And the little boy giggles, three years old, he giggles, and every time he giggles, he drools, and it splatters on his dad's face. He's leaned over, his nose is about two inches from his daddy's nose, and his daddy's saying, help me, I can't get up. And the little three-year-old boy is saying, I got you now, daddy, I got you now. I got you now. And you and I know that a six foot six, 230 pound solid massive muscle that throws men around in a wrestling ring could at any moment just with all of his strength push his little three year old across the room. But he doesn't do that. 
for the moment, this six foot six, 230 pound solid mass of muscle is at the mercy of a little three year old boy. Now, I didn't come to talk to you this morning about a wrestler or a little three year old boy. I came to talk to you about a great God, a holy God, a created God, a God that has all power, a God who created the heavens and the earth, who put the stars exactly where he wanted them and put the sun and the moon exactly where he wanted them, who took planet earth and shaped it and gouged out the valleys and lifted up the mountain peaks. This great God, almighty God, would ever place himself at the mercy of a frail Moses. But he does. And what I want to speak to you about this morning is God at the mercy of a man. Almighty God would ever place himself at the mercy of a man so that he would not, he could not do and act until he got permission from a frail man named Moses. Now, Moses was just a servant of God. And what God has to say to Moses and Moses' response, Moses gives a response to God, and I hope it's on the board behind me, and that is that it is a knowledge of the holy God that would enable a sinful man to ever have power with the holy God. After a redeemed people have turned their back on God, they've turned away from God, but there's something about, they know something about God that would enable them to have power with God. And that's what I want to speak to you about. It's, uh, if you have your Bible and you want to look with me, it's in Exodus chapter 32. Exodus 32. And the passage that I'm referring to of the the plea of God is found in verse 10 when God is crying out to Moses, let me alone, Moses. Let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against this people. I know what they've been doing. I know their attitudes. I know everything about them. So Moses, let me alone. And Moses apparently has been praying, has been interceding. I don't know all that Moses prayed. It's not recorded for us in the Bible. But I do know this much. There was a time that Moses prayed, and when he prayed, he prayed to God saying, I want you to, Lord, forgive this people. By your mercy, forgive this people. But if you you don't, if, if it's not in your pleasure to do that, then Lord, just blot me out of your book. And God appeals back to Moses and says, let me alone. Let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against this people. And Moses' response is, if I understand anything at all what you're saying to me, if I understand, God, what you're saying to me, that you will not bring your wrath upon this people as long as I keep praying. God, if I understand that, I ought to take my shoes off. And Moses says, then my answer to you, God, is no. No, I won't stop praying. Let me alone, Moses. No, I won't stop praying. You know the history of all of this. Let me just review it briefly. There, were, there was a man who had 12 sons. Ten of them were jealous over the younger brother. A time came when Joseph was to approaching his brothers and they said, let's kill him. And they decided, no. Let's just throw him in a pit. They threw him in a pit, and some Ishmaelites came by, and they sold Joseph into slavery, and the Ishmaelites carried him into Egypt. While in Egypt, he was sold to Potiphar. Potiphar saw the wisdom in Joseph's life and made Joseph overseer of his entire house. So while he was gone, he knew everything would be cared for. Joseph would do that. But Mrs. Potiphar had other thoughts in mind. And Ms. Potiphar made some uh, sexual advances towards Joseph and accused him. 
And so when Potiphar came home, she said, here's what he's done, and here's his coat. Now, when I read that in my Bible, my Bible tells me that Potiphar was captain of Pharaoh's army. And as captain of Pharaoh's army, he had the authority, I can get this man beheaded anytime I want to. Anybody, I, I can just pick a man off the street. I'm captain of the army. But apparently he knew that Mrs. Potiphar was a liar. And so he just had Joseph put in prison. While in prison, Joseph interprets a dream for Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said, well, what is the dream? And he interprets that, that there's going to be a period of plenty, and then there will be seven years of famine. And so what you need to do, Pharaoh, is to set up some houses of storage houses to store grain so when the famine comes. And Pharaoh said, I don't know of anybody any smarter than you that would be able to do that. And so Pharaoh decreed that I'm still king throughout the land in Egypt. I'm Pharaoh, but the one that's second in charge is Joseph. You'll do whatever Joseph says. You remember how his brothers came in, the drama, the, the drama of all of that. And finally, Joseph made himself known to his brothers. But the conclusion was, Joseph said, you, you guys go back and get daddy. And bring daddy back into the land, and I'll care for you. I'll take care of you during this period of famine. Well, you know your history, Old Testament history, as the years passed by, there were 70 souls, the Bible says, of Israelites that went into Egypt. 70. But during that period of time, they began to multiply and the Egyptians said, they're going to get stronger than us, they will overthrow us, and they will rule, and we will be their subjects. So they put Israel in bondage. 400 years they are in bondage, and the people are praying. And while they're praying, God hears their prayer, and he reaches over here to Moses and calls Moses to be their leader. He leads them out of Egypt and into the wilderness. And here's where the setting takes place. While they're in Egypt, or while they're in the wilderness, how, how are a redeemed people supposed to live, Jerry? Uh, we've been told when to get up, when we can go to the restroom, when we can bathe, when we can eat, how far we can walk. We've been subject to people in, in Egypt, and now we're redeemed, we're on our own, we're free, and God calls Moses up to the mountain, and Moses receives from God the civil laws, the dietary laws, the governmental laws, how we're to worship, and the sacrificial system, and all of this. And while he's giving Moses these commandments, Visiting with Moses with this, the children of Israel are doing something down here. They've made a golden calf. And in the midst of their conversation, God with Moses, and giving all the commandments, God says, Moses, you better get down. Your people are in, they got a problem. And Moses begins to intercede for Israel. And God says, let me alone. Let me alone. Now then, what I want you to do, do you have your Bible open? Or you may be printed up here. What it is, there, I want you to look, first of all, at the request of God. The request of God is based upon his knowledge of man. While God is communing with Moses, he still knows what they're doing down here. I'm giving you all these dietary laws, civil laws, uh, relationships and all of this, but I still know what's going on. Here's what the Bible says. And it's found in verse 7, 8, and that up through verse 10. The bond between Israel and God had been broken. God had said, I will be your God and you will be my people. And that's the way it's going to be forever. But Israel has done something. That, it, that bond had been broken and all the efforts that God had in had instilled in them, had been violated, and they made themselves a golden calf. So look, with, in verse 7, here's what God says. God's request came from a knowledge of, about man. They have behaved themselves corruptly. Well, how do you know that? We're up here. I know what they did. They have made a golden calf. Can you believe that? How... Well, idiotic is the only term that comes to my mind. How idiotic that people could make a golden calf, and as soon as they've made it, 
Then they all bow down and say, thank you so much for delivering us out of Egypt. You just made it. How idiotic can you be? And God says, they have corrupted themselves. They have, in verse 8, they say, they have turned aside from the way I've commanded them. I, I never instructed them in that way. But here they made this golden calf and are worshiping it instead of me. Verse 9 is a very critical statement. God says, I have seen. While we're doing this, I'm talking with you, Moses. I know what they're doing. And by the way, that phrase, I have seen, would be good for you and me to remember. Everything you have ever said and done in the daylight, God saw. Everything you have ever said and done in the privacy of your home, God has seen and heard everything about you. Everything you have ever done under the cover of darkness, you've spoken or done or acted or behaved, and nobody else was around of your friends, but God saw. Everything that man does is open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The Bible clearly states that. Nothing escapes the eye of God. In fact, he says that not even a sparrow falls to the ground, but he knows about that. God knows everything about us. They have behaved corruptly. They've turned aside from the way I've come. I have seen them. I know what they're doing. And they are an obstinate people. I like what the King James translation says. They're a stiff-necked people. You ever get a stiff neck? I was going to a conference in Butte, Montana in January. And when I got up, uh, like on Thursday, I think I was leaving them Friday or Saturday, but well, when I got up on Thursday, my neck was stuck. And I, to move around to see, I, it, it just stayed. And Johnny encouraged me, you need to go see Devin. And, and Devin King's a great guy. You, you, you need to see Devin if you get a stiff neck. But I saw, and, and he was able to work my neck, so I could not have survived a week, I don't think. But the word that he uses here, God uses, and he says they are stiff-necked people. It is set. And Moses, they're not going to turn from that. Though I would speak, they would never turn my direction. They would never look my way. They would never change in their posture. They're always going to be fixed this way. So Moses, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot, burn hot against Israel. Moses' reply comes from a knowledge of God. I want you to back up and see verse 7 again. If you've got your, your Bible open in verse 7, let me read it for you. Are, are you listening? Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once. For your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have behaved corruptly. Now listen to Moses. Moses replied in verse 11. Now, there are times, if I have an opinion, I could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jerry. He could stand right here and I, we could stand like this. And you could present yours case and I could present mine. And you could do that in front of Putin. He could present his case in you and yours. But we're talking about you standing before holy God. Is there anybody here that feels like standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with God? Moses did. How do you know Moses did? Verse 7, God said, Moses, go down. Your people that you brought out of Egypt have behaved themselves corruptly. Verse 11, Moses says, Sir, don't tag me with, the, with that. I was keeping my father-in-law's sheep, and you made a bush to burn, and it didn't 
wasn't consumed. And you spoke to me, and you said, I've come to deliver my people. God, they're not my people. Not only that, but you said, come and I will send you. And I told you, if I went back, they won't believe me. And you asked me, what do you have in your hand? And I said, a stick. He said, well, throw your stick on the ground. And I threw my staff on the ground and it became a snake. And then you told me to pick it up by the tail and I did and it became my staff again. And you said by this, I'm going to show miraculous things. Well, if I go, whom shall I say sent me? And God said, you just tell them I am sent you. And Moses is standing toe to toe with God. I didn't want to go and I told you that. And I told you also that I didn't speak well. I'm not an eloquent man. And you said, I know, I know, I hear what you're saying. Moses has been looking, or Aaron, your brother, has been looking for you, and he's almost here. I'm going to allow him to speak for you. I didn't ask for this job, so God, don't tag me with this. They're your people, and you brought them out. No, they're, Moses, they're your people, and you brought them out. No, God, there is absolutely no way that I can call down frogs and have frogs not any of them in the land of Goshen where we live, but frogs be in, in Egypt and they're in the ovens, they're in their plates, they're in their cups, they're in their bedrolls, they're everywhere. I, I can't do that. I didn't do that. God, you did that. And God, I can't turn water to blood. You did that. God, I can't call down uh, fire and brimstone from heaven. By the way, our people with the Green New Deal can't either. I didn't do that, God. I, I'm not in charge, and I can't control that. But you did that. And God, there is absolutely no way that I could call up locusts, and they would not touch the land of Goshen, but they would wipe out Egypt. God, don't, don't tag me with that. They're your people, and you brought them out by your mighty power. Any of you want to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with God? What, do, what Moses does, they're your people, you brought them out, and with great power and a mighty hand, you brought them out. Now, I want you to take note of three things. Moses is saying, God, if I understand all correctly, if I understand what you're saying, you're not going to bring judgment upon the nation of Israel until I stop praying. Let me alone, Moses. No, Lord, if you don't spare this people, then block me out of your book. Let me alone, Moses. No, I won't. What I just read to you in Moses' argument with God, this is going to be on the exam, by the way, so you need to write it down. What Moses does, number one, he reminds God of his great deliverance. God, in verse 11, with a mighty hand, you delivered Israel. I couldn't have done that. There is absolutely no way that I can stack up water on either side and a wall of water that will allow about a million people to pass through. There's no way I can do that. Only you can do that. And by your mighty power, God, you've done this. He reminds God of his great deliverance. Secondly, he reminds God of Israel's enemies. You know, Egypt is going to say, all you Amalekites and Hittites and Philistines and all you Assyrians and all you people, what you need to do is follow God. Follow God. Egypt's going to say, everybody follow God and he'll take you out into the wilderness and kill you.
God, they're going to mock you. A third thing Moses reminds God, you made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And earlier on in your Bible, when God made a promise to Abraham, the Bible says, since he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, Jerry. And usually when a man promises to do something, he has something of collateral. I got the ranch, and I'll put up the ranch, and if I fail to come through, you get the ranch. And since God could swear by no greater, when he made his promise to Abraham, he swore by himself. You know what that means? That if God doesn't come through in his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he ceases to be God. And if he ceases to be God, there's nothing. There's zero. Nothing. God has put his entire, all that he is at, at, in jeopardy. He, God, you made a promise to Abraham and to Jacob what you would do. That's going to be an exam. What Moses does he appeals to God's great deliverance, and that is, he's appealing to God's mercy. God, here's a people in captivity, and I know you don't owe them anything. All of you that are in this building this morning, God doesn't owe you anything. Whatever you have received, whatever good thing has come your way, it's been an act of God's mercy, and don't you forget it. God reminds the reason that Israel is out is, God, I know something about you, and you're a God of mercy. This is going to be an exam. There's a second thing that he does. He reminds God of his honor. The Egyptians are going to mock you. They're going to make fun of you. They're going to say there's an ulterior motive. Yeah, God says, follow me so I can take you out and kill you. No, God, I know something about you, and that is never a, that's not a part of you. God, there is nothing devious about you, nothing immoral about you, nothing corrupt about you, nothing perverse about you. I know that about you. There's a third word, and that is that Moses said, I know something about you, God. And I know that you're a God of faithfulness. You promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You promised them this land for, by the way, let me chase the rabbit. Any argument over what's going on in the Middle East today, it was settled way back in Old Testament history when God gave it to Abraham and he renewed that promise to a family and that family became a nation. He renewed that promise three times to a man, to a family, and a nation. This land is yours forever and forever. So if you have a debate whether Hamas ought to have it or Palestinians ought to, or Russia ought to have it, God said it belongs to Israel forever. Now, God said, uh, Moses said, God, I know something about you. I know something about you, that you're a God of mercy, you're a God of honor, and you're a God of faithfulness. What a man knows about God determines how he's going to pray. Moses, let me alone that my wrath may burn against them. I understand what you're saying. You're going to withhold as long as I keep praying. So God, since I know that you're a God of mercy, a God of honor, and a God of faithfulness, my answer to you, God, is no. No, I'm not going to stop praying. Folks, that happens all the time. I served as interim in Mesquite, Nevada, a number of years back for about nine months. 
and a couple came to me and they said, our daughter left us a note a couple of years ago and the note said, I'm leaving, don't try to find me. And they told me about two years after that, we received a note from her and she said, I'm in LA, don't try, don't try to find me. And they said to me, would you pray with us for our daughter? And the only thing I can think of is this, is that what we know of God and how these parents prayed, God, our daughter deserves your judgment. She deserves your wrath. She deserves your correction. But God, we know you're a God of mercy, a God of honor, and a God of faithfulness. Please, God, be merciful to our baby. I know of a grandfather who's praying for his grandson. God, be merciful to my grandson. I know of aunts and uncles who are praying, God, be merciful. And the only thing that stands between the judgment of God and their destruction is the intercessory prayer of some people that love them. If I were to ask you to stand this morning, I would sort of suspect there are some people here today that would have to say, the reason I'm here is because somebody prayed me through some difficult times in my life. God should have destroyed me in a split second, but he didn't. And I look back and I've been puzzled as to why God allowed me another hour, another day. I can tell you, you may never know who they are, but there were some people interceding for you. And God said, let me alone. I, I need to judge them. And that individual says, God be merciful to her. God be merciful to him. God placed himself at the mercy of a man. Now I want you to know, God hears our prayer. And there is God's response is given to us, which gives us a picture of the very character of God himself, the holy character. So in verse 14, the Bible says, So the Lord repented of the harm that he was going to do to his people. Now, come real close. Israel got a stay of execution. God told Moses, okay, I'm going to hear you, but everybody 21 years of age and over is going to die in the wilderness. I won't kill them right now. I won't destroy them right now, but they're not going into the promised land. Everybody 20 years old and younger will, but not those. So when the Bible says, God repented of the evil which he sought to do or the harm he was planning to do to them. Scholars, Brother E.C. scholars over the years have struggled with that verse. For Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? God is not a man that he would lie or that he would need to repent. And so this says, but God repented. What this does, sometimes we ought to talk about the will of God. And most people just, when they talk about the will of God, they're just thinking about the intention of the will of God. But when we talk about the will of God, there's the intention of the will of God, the permissive will of God, and the ultimate will of God. When my dad gave my brother permission in his permissive will to get his driver's license, it was not my dad's intent that my brother be killed in a head-on collision, but he was. But God, but my dad gave him his permissive will, allowed him to get his driver's license. In God's permissive will, because he created us in his own image, God in his permissive will will allow you to make a first-class mess of your life. And you earn the wrath of God. And God in his mercy, when people call upon him, God in his mercy 
and faithfulness and honor. His permissive will of God can be altered and God will allow you another day, another hour. And some of you got another hour today. Let me ask you the question. Is this the only time that you can ever think of that God was placing himself at the mercy of a man? When God told Moses, I'm not going to destroy this people as long as you keep praying. I'm at your mercy. You stop praying, then I can bring judgment. You keep praying. Moses said, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop praying. Is this the only time God was ever at the mercy of a man? No. More than 2,000 years ago, God placed himself at the mercy of a man when a little Jewish maiden went down into the mysterious depths of motherhood, gave birth to a little tiny baby, no room in the inn, and gave birth to a baby in a manger. And I can see it now, Joseph walking around, pacing, and finally the delivery comes, and he comes over to Mary, and they've wrapped the baby up, and he says, good job, Mary. I know you're tired. Give me this baby. And he scoots down, and Mary, you get your rest, and I'll get him settled. And Joseph is walking the baby. Do you realize that if there had been something in that stall there that Joseph had tripped over, that he would have dropped God? He's holding God. Mark Lowry wrote a beautiful song. Mary, did you know that when you kissed your baby boy, you kissed the face of God? God was at the mercy of Joseph and Mary while he's growing up. He grew up just like you and I grew up. In fact, Luke 2.52 says, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, just like everybody else. God placed himself at the mercy of Joseph and Mary. Is that the only time you can think of that God placed himself at the mercy of a man? No. Jesus was praying, and a group of soldiers came, and they took Jesus, and they took him into Pilate's judgment hall, and Peter and the, some of the other disciples and someone stayed ran, but there was one, John, stayed on the other side, and they had Jesus. And you read Matthew's account and Luke's account, and one kindly says they buffeted him. Another translation says they took their fist and smashed in his face. They blindfolded him and slapped him and said, you're a prophet, who is it that just now hit you? What they did to Jesus on the other side of that wall while John's out here. You know who they're just doing this to? This is God. God in human flesh. Read it in Isaiah 52, about verse 14. It says, before it goes into Isaiah 53, that he was wounded for our iniquities, bruised for our iniquities, by his stripes. Before we get into chapter 53, the conclusion of chapter 52 says, his visage, King James, his countenance, his face, was marred beyond recognition. When they got through with Jesus, you couldn't recognize he was a man. People are appalled at Mel Gibson's portrayal of probably worse than that. Who is this? This is God. God at the mercy of a man. Can you think of another time when God was at the mercy of a man? I can. Suspended on a cross with spikes in his hands. This is God, a very God. Let me ask you the question. Could he have come, could Jesus have come down off that cross? If you said yes, you're correct. Because Jesus is God. According to Colossians 2, I think it's about verse 9 and 10, it says, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So how much of God was left out of Jesus? None. In him dwelt all. I know what all means. I know what fullness means. 
In him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So as God, now he could have pulled his hand right through the spike and pointed down at one of those soldiers, zap, you're dead, and zap, you're dead, and wiped them all out. As God, he could have. If you said no, he couldn't, you would be correct. As man, he could not do that. Jesus took upon himself humanity to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. And while Jesus hangs on the cross, is there a conversation going on? I see what you're doing to my son. I see what you did in the judgment hall. I watched as you made him carry his cross down the Via Dolorosa. I watched. I saw you do that. I saw you nail those spikes in his hands. I treated you like you justly deserved. God doesn't do that. God placed himself. And these people at the foot of the cross get to live because there's a man standing between them and God. And he's praying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. The only reason they survived is because of Jesus' prayer. Let me ask you, can you think of any other time when God places himself at the mercy of a man? I, I can recall one, and I know of At this very moment, God places himself at the mercy of the man Christ Jesus. Every one of you that entered this building, if you reviewed your past, the conduct of your life, the thoughts that have raced through your mind, the deeds you have done, the vulgarities that have come through your lips, if you reviewed all of that, God would be just in wiping you out right now. And the only reason that you get to be here is because 1 Timothy 2.5 says, there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. God places himself at the mercy of a man. When I mess up, which is quite often, and I can come and make my appeal to Jesus. And I say to him, Father, I'm in desperate need of your renewal. Forgive my sin and renew a right spirit within me. Bob, you don't deserve that. But my, my son Jesus told me he would forgive you. And Jesus says, Father, I promised him that if he confessed his sin and if he called upon me, Jesus said, Father, I promised him I would forgive him. So, Father, and that's the reason I got to preach this morning, is because of one man whose name is Jesus. And he is saying, Father, forgive him. For you that are seated right here, I don't know where you've been and what your past is, but I do know this, that every wrong you've ever committed, every vulgar thing you've ever done, whatever place you've ever been, whatever sins have been in your life, that if an individual calls upon the man Christ Jesus and asks Christ Jesus to forgive them of their sin, and Lord Jesus, would you enter into my life and remake me? Make me a vessel of honor, one that would be a praise and honor to you. That Jesus Christ forgive my sin. I can see it now on judgment day. 
Satan, according to Revelation 12, 11, he's the accuser of the brethren, and he's rubbing his hands, and you think, oh, wait till Bob gets here. And he said, God, I've got some things against him. Open up the books. And God opens up the books of Bob's life, this preacher. And the father says, I can't read anything. Whatever was written here, it's all covered with blood. Satan said, look at page two. And he flips to page two. And whatever accusation Satan had written down, the father says, I can't read anything. It's all covered with blood. The blood of Jesus has blotted out all of his sin. The only reason I get to be here today is of the intercession of my Savior, Jesus. And folks, you can leave here today as spotless and clean as a brand new baby born in this world by receiving Christ Jesus as personal Savior and surrendering the ownership of your life to Him that will allow Him to remake you to do anything and everything in you that He wants to do. And you're saying, well, you know, I did that a number of years back, but I have failed. Do you think God might receive me renew? Absolutely. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins, of all of our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You can leave here spotless, spotless, don't have to use gain or oxidol or anything. Just the blood of Jesus will do it for you. And Him coming into your heart and life. All I know is God places Himself at the mercy of Moses. And a nation was spared. And Moses said, I'm not going to stop praying. You that are here You've got some relatives. Maybe it's your son. Maybe it's your daughter. Maybe it's your brother or sister or wife or husband or uncle, aunt or somebody. And they've messed up big time. God said, I need to tend to them. God, I know something about you. You're a God of mercy, a God of honor, and a God of faithfulness. Father God, I have to confess, like Job, this morning I've uttered things far too wonderful. You're greater than any word that man could put together. No possible way we could express the greatness of the God that created us for himself. Rightly so, we have earned your judgment. America has earned your judgment. Our nation with its woke culture, our nation with its perverse ideas, our nation that has turned its back upon you, God, I'm confident of this, that somewhere there's an Abraham out there praying. There's a Moses out there praying. There's a mother and a dad. There's somebody out there praying for the nation. God, I know something about you, that you're a God of mercy. Be merciful to America. God, give us one more day to repent and come back to you. Father God, there's a young man out there. There's a young lady. God has been, you've been very patient with them. You've given them another day, and today's the day they need to come home to you. Whatever you want to do in these next few moments of invitation, they're yours. Speak to our hearts in such a way that we know it's you, and may we give the response in obedience to you. In Jesus' strong name, amen. I want to invite you 
however God has spoken to your heart. Individually, you know, if I could just come to the altar just for a moment and to have a brother pray with me, I am almost positive that there would be a brother that would just come and stand here and let you come and flip by his side and that he would pray with you. I'm almost sure that in this crowd there's a woman that knows the Lord and that she'll come and stand right here and that if there's a young lady present and you say, I just need a woman to pray with me, you just come and slip along by her side and she'll come and pray with you. There'll be others that would be delighted to do that. We don't want you to leave here. We don't want you to leave here without having doing business with God. Folks, we got, we got business to do with God. We've got to get it right. We, we have to get it right. And you can do that. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses of all sin. So could we sing something? Yes, there she is. While they're playing something, let's just do business with God, you and your own heart. in the gap for you. Let me alone. No, I won't leave you alone. Brother Jerry, we are so glad that you were here this morning every one of you God is so faithful and so good I would like to lead you in a prayer and for those who would be viewing over the internet this morning I would like to lead you in a prayer if you would like to pray a prayer of repentance and accept Christ as your Savior and the way you accept Christ as your Savior is only by making Jesus your Lord and if you would like to pray this prayer and Accept Christ as Savior and make Jesus the Lord of your life. I would like to lead you in the prayer right now. Follow me or pray the, the way that if you would like to pray in your own words. But let's pray something like this. Heavenly Father, we love you and we magnify you. I believe you. You are the creator of heaven and earth. You're the God of eternity. You are the lover of my soul. I believe that Jesus Christ is your Son, your only begotten Son, whom you sent to this earth through a virgin named Mary. He came as a baby, became a man, and then he gave his life through the shedding of his blood for the salvation of my soul. The blood that is pure and cleansed that washes away sin. I accept this Jesus as my Savior right now, and I make Jesus my Lord. Jesus, 
you are my Lord. And I will serve you all the days of my life. Father, forgive me of my sin and wash me. Wash me clean with the blood that was shed. The blood from a sinless lamb, Jesus the Christ, your son. Forgive me. Deliver me from my shame, all that brought me embarrassment and, and guilt. Deliver me from my shame. And heal me from my pain. That which was imposed upon me and that which I imposed upon myself. And I will serve you from this day forward. You are my God. Jesus is my Lord. And I say so as I pray so in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. If you believe that, would you say amen? If you prayed that prayer, would you say amen and give him praise?